Turn to your King James Bible to Mark chapter 5. I'm going to talk today about it, preaching a changed life, but no gospel. Um, <clears throat> you say, is that what you're going into, Brother Brian? Oh no, my no. I preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, certainly. I believe Jesus died on the cross. He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Um, I believe He shed His precious blood on the cross to wash away sins. I believe His righteousness is imputed to a sinner. I preach those things. I believe that you have to you know, understand and believe by faith that Jesus died on the cross because you can't see it happening. And then you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You call upon God and say, God, I believe Your Word. I believe what it says about Jesus Christ. And I'd like to be saved. I don't want to go to hell when I die. You come in a broken, repentant state. That's why you call for help. Okay? So, this sermon isn't about what I preach. But I do want to show you the importance of the changed life that accompanies salvation. And uh, that there was actually a man who was told to go out and preach his changed life before the gospel was even available. Really? Well, let's look at the scriptures and see if I'm right. It's a good habit to get into. That's why I tell you to hold a Bible in your hands. Don't just sit there and listen on your iPhone or whatever. No, get a Bible and follow along. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to preach the Word to you so that you'll open up your Bible and check it out for yourself. Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by, asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And I've preached this many times, but you really need to get a hold of that. Devil-possessed people love going to church. I can assure you of that. And you'll see them up there, and they'll be singing praises to Jesus, and they'll be out there in the, the crowd putting their hands up and, you know, praising Jesus. I mean, Jesus is physically on the earth. You'd think that, okay, they can do it now because it's just they're faking it and they're not really seeing Jesus. Jesus was physically on the earth here in Mark chapter 5, what we're reading about, and a, de a devil-possessed man comes up that's crazy. I mean, look at all the stuff there in the verses 2 down through uh, verse 5. Just a crazy man, and he sees Jesus, and he runs towards Jesus. He doesn't run away from Jesus. Runs towards him, and he worships Jesus. Always remember that. It's one of those key scriptures that you have to always think about that in your mind. Somebody, oh, I believe in Jesus. I go to church. I'm a Christian. They could be totally devil-possessed. You need a little bit more information before you say, well, praise the Lord, brother or sister. Come on in here and be with my children while I go to the store or something. <laughs> no, no. You need a little bit more than just a profession. I don't want to get ahead of myself. <clears throat> Verse 7, And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter in to them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently, violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about two thousand. That's a lot of devils to have in you. And were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Nothing has changed. <laughs> Not one thing has changed since then. You get the most weird, tattooed, pierced, whatever, alcoholic, just 
as bad as bad can be, sodomite, whatever else, and all of a sudden, boom, they get saved and they change. Their physical appearance changes, their attitude changes, their speech changes, everything changes, and people that once laughed at them and would joke with them and whatever else, avoid them like the plague. Absolutely, I've seen this thing myself. Well, Brian Denlinger used to be a really cool guy back when he was a motorcycle guy and whatever else and adrenaline junkie and he was crazy and everything. God said, he's reading the Bible? Ugh. What a freak. He's in ministry now? Makes these videos attacking this and attacking that, saying all this stuff about sin and everything? Ugh. Weird, isn't it? Verse 16, And they that saw told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Who wants to follow Jesus? You know, like the song goes, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. Goes on through. That's what he wanted to do. What does Jesus say to him? Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, verse 19, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. See this guy coming? That guy looks really familiar. Boy, he's a decent looking guy. I guess he's maybe an upstanding businessman or something. Uh, oh, hi. Oh, hi. What's doing? Whoa, wait a second. You're, you're the guy that was out in the tombs? Huh? What in the world happened? Jesus changed my life. That's why I'm here like this now. All those wicked things I did in the past and everything else. I need to go tell more people. You need to get to understand about Jesus. Was he preaching the gospel? Was this devil-possessed guy preaching the gospel? Uh, Mark chapter 5, no, he wasn't. Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. Jesus didn't say to him, go out and preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't say anything. He, there's not one word about the gospel in Mark chapter 5. Not one word. And we'll see here in a little bit what, what the big contrast is here, which is really strange. But Jesus changes this man's life and he says, go out and show people what the Lord's done for you. And all men did marvel. He walks away from the group of people and they say, hey, who's that guy you were talking to? That's that guy that was out in the tombs that used to cut himself. We tried to chain him up a couple times. He's breaking the chains. That's the man. What? Him? Are you kidding me? You see, that's the testimony of true salvation. That's why I see a lot of these Bathlicks and everything else, these Baptists, and, and just little clean, smooth faced, and they just have never done anything wrong. And I was raised in church, and I got saved when I was two years old, and, and I've just been squeaky clean all my life. What change happened? Where's the change? I don't mean you have to be some horrible, just as wicked as you can be to get in order to get saved, but there needs to be something there in terms of I was a sinner and now I'm saved. Look at the difference here. But the enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they want you to say, oh, there doesn't have to be a change. It just it's, so, it's just so logical that to just say, you get saved that things change. <laughs> it's not difficult. It's really not. If you get saved, there's a change. I've heard so many testimonies of people and they just talk about what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart, like the old hymn sa says. But I'm a false preacher because I'm teaching lordship salvation that there's some kind of a change that happens or whatever else. And I question people that say, I'm saved, I'm born again, and yet they're living in all kinds of wicked sin and no conviction, no chastening of the Lord in their life. Um, that's a bad thing. 
And if Jesus Christ doesn't care, you say, well, Jesus doesn't care how much your life changes. He only cares what you believe, friend. Really? Then why on earth did he tell that man that had the devils in him to go out and show what great things the Lord hath done for you? He didn't give him the gospel. He didn't say you're going out and you preach the gospel. Show what things the Lord's done for you. How he was there listening to Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Pretty amazing. Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to show you the really amazing thing, though, about this. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man. Huh? But go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Huh? What? What's with the hypocrisy here? This guy that has the devils come out of him, and the Lord says, hey, go out into your country, tell everybody. Tell everybody about what I did for you. Show what the Lord's done for you. This man here, being cleansed of leprosy, don't tell anybody about this, okay? Go to the priest, go quietly, just do the, the sacrifice. Huh. Almost because uh, the man with the leprosy that was cleansed really wouldn't have had much of a testimony. Oh, you were sick and then it went away? Well, you know, yeah. But the man with, that had the devils in him? Hmm. Now that's a good uh, testimony out there. Yeah, the guy that had the 2,000 devils, yeah, he's out there. Look at him, clothed in his right mind, going out there talking about Jesus. Huh. I mean, how do you explain that? If you're into this easy believism thing and you say there's no change necessary, why does Jesus tell one guy that's possessed with devils, go tell everybody about it, another guy that's cleansed of leprosy, don't tell anybody? You have to do all kinds of gymnastics and whatever else to try to prove. Well, you see, at this point in time, in this particular part of the dispensation you know, that they were in and whatever else, they weren't supposed to say certain things until the temple sacrifice had been done. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. Explain it away. Just explain away the plain teachings of Scripture. That's what lost people do. That's why lost people go and study religion in universities, by the way, because they're trying to explain away the plain teachings of the King James Bible, that any idiot can get it and just read it and say, wow, that's really something. What a blessing. I mean, isn't it a blessing to read how the man that had the devils in him, they were cast out and he was clothed and in his right mind, sitting there learning from Jesus? And how he goes out and he witnesses for Jesus? Isn't that a blessing when you're born again? Can't you wait to meet that guy? I'm looking forward to meeting him. I'll tell you who else I'm looking forward to meeting. I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting Jeffrey Dahmer. I believe the man got genuinely born again after he got caught and was in prison. He was a you know church attending Christian, you know, Christian back when he was killing people and cannibalizing, you know, sodomites and things that he was involved with. But uh, after he went to prison, one of the victims that he had killed, a, a young black man, his sister came and she was saved and she witnessed to Jeff Dahmer and said, you need to get saved, Jeff. And his father sent him some creation science materials and things. And Jeff Dahmer realized, hey, I'm going to be accountable to God. And he got saved and testified publicly before the whole world to see I'm saved now. I'm born again. What a wonderful testimony. Like the man that was possessed with the devils. Jeff got the gospel. The man possessed with devils didn't. But both men had a testimony of a changed life. I like testimonies. I like to hear about uh, people that were former outlaw biker second in command of the outlaw bikers and things, David Spurgeon, how he got saved and Lord changed his life. I like to hear about sodomites that uh, left that wicked lifestyle. Got saved, Lord saved them and changed their life. New Agers, witches. I'd love to hear more Jesuits getting saved, but they're, most of those are just so far gone up in their brain, you know, there's not much hope for them. 
Anybody out there, I like to hear that change life. I like to see what the Lord has done because I've seen too many empty professions. I'm a Christian. I'm a you know, wonderful Christian. And then times get rough. And all of a sudden, oh, oh, I used to be a Christian. You know, you see that with these atheists all the time. I was raised in church. I went to a Christian school. I was raised Catholic. What are you now? I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. This book is a book of fairy tales and everything else. They had a profession, but no changed life. Changed life is important. Very important. And by the way, you say, well, couldn't somebody fake a changed life? Oh, absolutely. But they're not going to stick with the Bible-believing movement very long. They can, I've, again, I've seen that. I've seen people, they, oh, I've had a changed life. I'm saved. I'm genuinely born again. And then they start to realize what being a Bible believer actually means. And they realize how dull it is to somebody who's lost and how it's a just savor of death unto death, the Bible calls it. And they say, okay, I don't want to be part of this anymore. They'll continue a few years and then they just go, I'm quitting. Done. Over. <laughs> Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 through 20. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Meaning himself, not Peter, like the Catholics teach. Proving again that they're lost, and that's why they don't understand the scriptures. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now look at, what, look at this, verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. What? Huh? So before the gospel, Jesus tells his own disciples, don't talk about who I really am. The thing that the Father has revealed to you here, Peter, yeah, don't tell anybody about that, okay? Wait till after I die on the cross and buried and resurrected, and then you can start telling people. But the, the devil-possessed man there, the maniac of Gadara, as they called him, or whatever some people say that, or the, the Gadarenes and things, hey, go out and show what great things the Lord's done for you. Huh? You mean a changed life, a radically changed life, is that important to Jesus Christ? Mm hmm. Oh, but you can get saved and change a few things and then just limp along for the rest of your life, you know, kind of just like, you know, Frankensteiners don't just kind of drag your, your, your dead carcass of a leg and you say, oh, there's some sins down there, I don't want to get rid of those, and I'll just kind of drag this along for a while and just kind of be half alive in Jesus Christ and half dead with my sins that I don't want to give up. You know, I have a little bit of TV back there. I can't get rid of that yet. And I do like to smoke occasionally. And I like that. And I just kind of drag my alcohol with me and, you know, looking at some, you know, swimsuit stuff, you know, once in a while. And I just kind of drag that stuff along. Uh, no, you're supposed to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him, that answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. <laughs> what a stupid thing to say. You know, and yet that's what a lot of modern professing Christians do. Let's build a nice church here. This would be a really good property. We could build a church. Okay, get some scripture for that, and then maybe we can talk. <laughs> Verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. 
It's an interesting three words there, save Jesus only. Jesus saves only. <laughs> or Jesus only saves. You can switch it around there. But uh, not saying that you should change the Bible, but understand what I'm saying. Verse 9, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to every man you can. Go back to your country and spread it around what great things the Lord's done. Oh, actually, no, it doesn't say that. It says, uh, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. It's got to be a weird thing if you're one of his disciples. So the Lord revealed something to us, and then we go up to the Mount of Transfiguration, we see the Lord change, and, we, and Moses and Elijah are there talking with him. Elias is New Testament word for Elijah. Seeing all this great stuff, and we're not supposed to talk about it. But the guy over there with the, the devil-possessed guy, you know, you, you go on and tell everybody about it. He wanted to be one of your disciples. He said, no, no, you don't need to be that. Go tell people. Go tell people what the Lord's done for you. Hmm. Mark chapter 7. Do you ever wonder why the Lord used Paul so much? The Apostle Paul, the man that caused uh, Christians to be taken into prison and ultimately put to death. A Pharisee. You know, highly educated Pharisee. Why in the world would the Lord use that guy? Um, because there was a lot of things he had to suffer for the Lord's sake. There was a major... Uh, changed life, where Paul's saying, it is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And it's so funny too because a lot of these uh, easy believism Baptists and whatever else, and I pick on the Baptists a lot because they have a King James Bible, so they're without excuse. You get some of these new ones that have the new versions, well at least they can claim to be completely without any spiritual power at all. But but you get some of these Baptists and, and uh, they don't really talk about their sin. They don't really talk about, oh, I used to do some really stupid things and, and whatever. And you don't really see that separation from the world. They'll laugh about the thing of being vexed by rock music in a grocery store. They think that's funny. Oh, you're, you're bothered by that? Oh, come on, that's not that bad. You know, I've been persecuted because I go out and cram my... Uh, conversion experience thing, my Jack Hiles high pitch salesman conversion stuff and when I go door to door and knock doors and I don't take no for an answer and I sneak into places where I'm not allowed to and then the police come and throw me out of it and I say I'm being persecuted for preaching the gospel. That's real persecution. Uh, no, that's called you being a solicitor. <laughs> Illegal solicitor is what you are. That's not preaching the gospel. You look at the gospel that this, these people preach, it's not Lining up here. Let's continue here. Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter seven, verse thirty-one. Let me get a piece of paper here so I don't get it mixed up. Mark chapter seven, verse thirty-one. And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came out. Or he, he came unto the Sea of Galilee, through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and saith unto him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. And were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf, deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Did it again. Another time. Don't tell anybody about this. Almost like when there's something physical. You know, some kind of a physical thing. And whatever. That's the flesh. But you get some guy that's really messed up spiritually. And the Lord saves him. The Lord does something for him, I, I should say, changes his life. Um, because as before he died on the cross, understand that. The gospel wasn't available yet to the man that had all the devils in him. Um, when it's a spiritual thing, then there's that big change that the Lord's looking for. Luke chapter 8, verse 26 through 39. 
And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. And he saw Jesus. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. And by the way, I'll just say this before we continue. This is the same uh, retelling of the story that happened in Mark chapter 5. But before we continue here, I'd like to make the point that there were other people that came and they had devils in them and they would start saying who Jesus Christ is and Jesus would say, be silent. He would tell them to be quiet. Hmm. Uh, back to verse 29. Um, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there an herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Uh, then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. When they that fed them, fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. <laughs> like we talked about before. They also which saw it told them by what means he, he that was possessed of the devils was healed. Then the, the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear, and he went up into the ship and returned back again. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine own house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Uh, now, now, you know, understand here when it's talking this way, um, that when it says there, how great things God hath done, that, you know, it was referring to God the Son. Even though it doesn't really say it in the text there. <laughs> so I'd kick the little Trinity thing there real quickly. Um, show great things how that God hath done for thee. Is there any mention of God the Father doing anything for this man in this context? No, um, that's Jesus that cast the devils out of this man. And he says, "Show, go up back to your country there and show um, how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Sorry, Trinitarians, uh, Jesus and God the Father are the same being, the same person. There's only one person in God, not three separate persons with their own wills and everything else. Uh, that's nonsense. That is satanic Trinitarian philosophy. And there's another verse that proves it. Show how great things God has done for you. And he says, okay, look what great things Jesus did for me. The text defines itself. Go down to verse 49 of the same chapter, Luke 8:49. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answering, answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. What a bunch of sarcastic jerks. You know, as God manifests in the flesh, comes in to heal a daughter, and they're laughing and mocking him. <laughs> Verse 54, And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Physical healing of the flesh. Hey, um, just made this great thing happen. Raise this little girl up from the dead. Don't tell anybody about it, okay? Maybe it's because there's another reason. Maybe it's because there's a lot of people out there that uh, they want to have physical healing, but they don't want spiritual healing. 
Did you ever think about that? Some soldier's in a foxhole and he gets wounded and he cries out and he says, Oh God, please help me to live. Please God, save me from this. I don't want to die. Oh God, don't let me die. Oh. Does he want his soul saved? His spirit? To be quickened? No, he's interested in the blood that's coming out between his fingers. And he's screaming for the medic and everything else. They put him on a stretcher and they're hauling him to the field hospital. And he's going, oh God, help me, oh God. Well, he's going out to God. He obviously believes in God some way, somehow. But all he wants is his physical healing. Some parents out there. Their child dies. They give him the death shot. Jesus is physically walking around on the earth. They come out, Jesus, our daughter just died. She's just 21 years old. She went into convulsions and then she died. God, please save us or save her. Okay. I can come in and bring her back to life, but you know what? That's just her flesh. Does she really want to be saved? Is she, really, is she ever going to live for me? You know why the charismatic stuff, the Benny Hinn and the, all the other Oral Roberts and all that stuff, you know why it appeals to lost people so much? Because they can get healing of their physical body. And they want to be in good health physically so that they can continue to live in sin. That's exactly it. You don't want some stinking preacher up there telling you you shouldn't be eating junk food that's toxic you shouldn't be drinking that alcohol, getting yourself drunk. You shouldn't be smoking those cigarettes, giving yourself emphysema and lung cancer and just huge spikes of sugar every time you smoke the cigarette. That's the main issue, actually, with it, white sugar. Uh, it's not just the nicotine in it. I mean, there's lots of toxicity. You shouldn't be doing drugs. You shouldn't be looking at pornography. It's ruining your mind. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't... Hey, you're getting, you're getting past the flesh now. You're getting into the spiritual body. Back off. Hey, let me tell you how the Lord changed my life, how I went from being such a wicked lost man that was into all kinds of motorsports stuff, and I loved heavy metal and rock and roll, and, and I loved all that stuff. I was a lot of fun to be around. Lost people liked me in the past. Now I'm just a killjoy. You see, the real issue here is Jesus, when he's healing people's flesh, he's saying, hey, you know what? Don't go tell anybody about this. It's only when he heals somebody spiritually. Go on out and tell everybody how great things the Lord has done for you. Let them know. Do you have a testimony? Do you have some kind of a change that happened? I hope so. If you didn't, you need to examine yourself. Whether you're in the faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And if some faker that you're sitting under his ministry is not preaching a changed life, truly changed life, and that preacher is loved by the world, um, I'd run away from that guy. Um, there better be a change there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 18, is not a quick change either, by the way. You see these people, that the, the stardom, you know, type of uh, celebrity Christian or something, you know, you get the Johnny Todd types, you know, he got saved out of the Illuminati and he's, you know, a month later he's out running, you know, speaking in Baptist churches and he has a whole circuit of Baptist churches he's speaking. He wasn't ready for that. He wasn't ready for that. Um, saved or lost, I have no idea what Johnny Todd, what the, the situation was with that man. Um, I think he said some really good stuff, but you know what, he wasn't ready to go out and preach. Uh, in terms of preaching doctrine and whatever else, you know, go tell what the Lord's done for you, absolutely. That's fine. But to be going and, and you know, really make a big thing here and whatever else, eh, <laughs> you need to kind of step back before you go into ministry and just learn some Bible and things for a while. There's a lot of other examples of that, too. I see a lot of these people that, that yeah, they do have a changed life, at least they say that they have a changed life. And they just jump right into ministry and they make a mess of their lives. They don't count the cost before they go to war with the devil. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 through 18. 
For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we know, have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We're to preach a changed life, brethren. It's all, you know, I'm going to keep hitting this thing as long as I'm alive. I've seen way too many false converts out there. Uh, they don't have a changed life. The Lord's not doing anything in their life. Um, they're just going on in their own ways. They're so far away from the scriptures. I mean, I have relatives that, uh, oh, we're Christians and whatever else. And you say, okay, uh, I can show you here, here, and here where the Bible says, the Bible, you know, just put that book away from me. Get that thing away. You know, I don't care what the Bible has to say, all right? I don't care. You and your stinking Bible thumping, just get it in my face, just judging everything I do. And you have relatives too like that, don't you? Yeah, they uh, liked you back before you changed. You know, you know what happened to you and the whole thing. You know, I'm worried about you and all this stuff. They don't like that change. Lost people don't. So, uh, is it important to have a changed life? Yes, it is. Absolutely. And uh, the Lord, the Lord could have revealed that uh, to that maniac of Gadara there, the devil possessed man of the Gadarenes, he could have revealed to him the gospel and said, hey, here's here's the gospel. But uh, whatever he did at that point in time, he just simply said, hey, go on out and show how great things the Lord's done for you. And I'll tell you right now, that's one of the strongest ways that you can witness to people. Um, I hate tattoos with a passion, but you know what? Uh, if you have tattoos from your lost life and you're out there witnessing and people say, they kind of look down at your tattoos, you can say, hey, you know, look at this. Look at these tattoos on my arms. I showed you how wicked I was. You don't say, well, these tattoos are here and I just got one yesterday with Jesus on it or something. Yeah, I saw this, you know, saved guy that professing Christian one time and he's got this huge big cross up here, Jesus saved or something. I thought, <laughs> yeah, okay, that really makes sense. James White, you know, he's getting more tattoos all the time. That guy's such a wicked little impy devil. Just this little, you know, just, you know little shaved head and just talking about all these big words and everything else. And, you know, it's, it's, whoever listens to him, he's just lost. I mean, my goodness. Just more tattoos all the time. I guess eventually he'll have piercings and, you know, horns implanted in his head and whatever else. And people say, he's the greatest Bible scholar around. <laughs> you know? Yeah, old-time preachers. Boy, they're out there getting tattoos all the time. Yeah, sure. Um, there should be a change there. And I don't mean a change for the worse either. And if there's a change there, okay, you screwed up a lot in your past lost life. Well, use it as a way to witness to people. Be like the uh, man that had the devils in him. And go on out there and say, boy, I'll show you what the Lord's done for me. Look at that guy's picture here. Long hair. Cut my hair. The Bible teaches that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Um, I cleaned up my life in here and I, I used to be just a chain smoker. I know what you're going through, friend. I know exactly what you're going through. Um, I can tell when somebody's a porn addict. I can tell. There's a lot of signs that I went through myself, different ways that I can see, oh, that guy, yeah, he's got a perversion problem. I can spot him. You see, Matthew chapter 7 talks about removing the beam out of your own eye so that you can pull out the moat out of your brother's eye. Um, talking about saved people too, by the way, but uh, I can judge a lot of people because of the wicked stuff I used to do in my past. I can go out and I can show how great things the Lord's done for me. You understand? It's not just the gospel and then don't worry about it after that. Oh my, no. You need help when you're really a sinner. When you really are messing your life up, you need help. You're looking for help. You're looking for a way out, a new life. So, that's going to be it for this study.
just wanted to put that one out there. Just the Lord put that in my heart the other day. Just was thinking about this whole thing, meditating on the scriptures, and I got to thinking about it. And I thought, yeah, it's a very interesting point. The Lord sends him out and says, go tell people. Other people heals their family members and whatever else. Hey, don't, don't tell anybody about this. <laughs> Disciples, uh, thou art the Christ, the Son of the Most High God. You know, you know okay. Lord showed it to you, you know, my Father's in, in heaven. He showed it to you, but just don't tell anybody about it. Mount of Transfiguration is glorified in front of him, and he comes and he says, don't tell anybody. But some guy that has a really changed life, the Lord's excited about that. You know, the Bible talks about the, the thing of jewels. People are likened to jewels and things, precious stones. And um, the Lord likes a collection of precious stones, but you know, um, back when I was in wood turning, you know what my favorite types of wood were? Um, not the boards that had just perfect straight grain, just not any, no knots, no figuring to them, burl type, whatever, uh, grain patterns and whatever else. I liked the most gnarly, twisted pieces of wood that I could find, and they produced the most beautiful wood turnings back, back when I would make things. And, you know, the Lord's, uh, I got that from the Lord. The Lord likes some uh, very unique people to save. And I'm sure he's got quite a collection when we get to heaven. Um, he's not, uh, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The righteous is that no character, straight grain board. The sinner been out there and weather beaten and, all kinds of grain, twisted grain and big knots and whatever else in that. Maybe a nail sticking in one part where the sawmill cut it off. <laughs> and the Lord says, oh, that's a board I like right there. Boy, that thing will have a great testimony for me. Maybe you're watching this and you're lost and you don't know the Lord and you're saying, God wouldn't want me. Man, I have my hair dyed some weird collar right now and I've gotten a bunch of tattoos and I'm on prescription medication and I've messed around in sodomy a little bit and even was transgendered a little for a while and I'm so screwed up in my head and whatever else. And I understand what you're saying there, preacher, but, I, but God wouldn't want me. Uh, quite on the contrary. God wants you. He wants you as a sinner because He wants to be able to have a testimony, have that testimony of your life showing how great things the Lord's done for you. And if you like to weird people out and everything, if you really like to be a nonconformist and whatever by weirding people out. What better way than to become a Bible-believing Christian? Boy, talk about weirding people out. Let me tell you, they'll avoid you. All right? <laughs> you want to be really weird? Get saved. Ask the Lord to save you. Come to Him as a broken sinner. Get a King James Bible. And just start going out and talking to people about this book right here. There's no greater way to be a nonconformist. All the tattoos and piercings and whatever weird clothes and whatever else will never get you the kind of uh, nonconformist attention as just believing this book right here. That's going to be it. I do pray that you take heed to what I've said in the study. Um, if you have never been born again, if you can't look back and say, yeah, this is when my life changed and you know the process of sanctification began and I gave up this and I gave up that. If you don't have that testimony, then you need to get saved. Um, you have an empty profession is all that you have um, based on something that you heard or whatever else. Um, but if there's been no change, it didn't take. So uh, that is going to be it, and we will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.